good to go? Sure. You, okay. All right. Um, so before I introduce uh, Sydney, I want to actually um, just say uh, a couple of words about Modernism Week, because I know um, a lot of you members have um, signed up to be docents and you're wondering why you haven't heard from us yet. Um, we run into delays getting information out to people because we were waiting, first of all, to see if Modernism Week was going to happen. And second of all, um, you know, we had had to wait for COVID protocols that were changing all the time and so on. So um, just want to let you know, if you have signed up to be docents at any of the Preservation Mirage tours, um, that we will be uh, sending you emails about that uh, later this week, just to tell you where to go, where, where to check in and times and that kind of thing. Um, so thank you for your patience on that front. Um, there really has been a lot to take into account this year. So um, I'm, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Sydney Williams, who's our uh, guest today. We're very honoured to have her with us, of course. And um, Sydney is the former curator of architecture and design at the Palm Springs Art Museum. She's also the daughter-in-law of E. Stuart Williams, whose work she's going to be talking about today. She is the author of a book on Williams' work entitled E. Stuart Williams, An Elegant Modernist. And Sydney works tirelessly on behalf of architecture and preservation in the Greater Palm Springs area, and we're very honoured to have her with us today. Um, one thing I wanted to mention before Sydney starts, and this is personal for me, is that I think it was almost five years ago that Sydney, perhaps unknowingly, managed to clinch a publishing deal for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, we were in the uh, museum cafe in Palm Springs and I was there with Gibbs Smith, the publisher. And um, he, uh, this was, as I say, a few years ago, sadly he's passed away now. But um, I mentioned to, I was talking to Sydney and Gibbs asked me who she was and he expressed interest in meeting her. So Sydney did the absolutely wonderful thing walked over to Gibbs Smith sang my praises to Gibbs Smith and the publishing deal was forthcoming <laughs> I love that <laughs> of course I don't remember it <laughs> oh I I remember it very clearly it was a moment so thank you I owe you massive thanks um so yes I'll always be grateful to you for helping me out that day <laughs> well I return the admiration because what you've done from Rancho Mirage is really outstanding with your writing, your research and your advocacy and leading your group. I mean, it's just outstanding. It's, as we've said with preservation, it's a team effort. It, everybody has to work together to make it happen. And it, it happens so slowly and we have to be patient and that's hard sometimes, but I think with the more we help each other out, the better. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Sydney. I appreciate your support. And, and, you know, we, we are, we are a very collegial preservation group in the back, yeah. aren't we? Yeah, I think uh, that's what makes it really fun, because we support each other. And we have the same enthusiasm and passion, which we share. Absolutely. Okay, Sydney, take it away. We want to hear all about E. Stuart Williams. And, and well, it's always a pleasure to talk about Stu, and it's a particular pleasure today to talk to Preservation Mirage. And uh, I wanna thank you and John for managing the talk and for Jim, your husband, for the photographs, because I use, a, you'll see a number of them in the presentation. I also appreciate the, the very kind willingness of Lisa Burnell, who's the current owner of the, of the Kenniston House, to be interviewed by me. We had a lovely time at the house and I asked her a lot of questions and it's really nice to keep in touch with the owners as they are, become the stewards of the house. So uh, although this talk is primarily about the Keniston house, I thought it would be a good idea to talk a little bit about Stu's background and early career and then to touch on other projects that he's done in Rancho Mirage, just to give you a little context. I'm trying to advance. It's not letting me advance, John. Maybe, maybe you got to click on, 
click on the window that you're in there. Maybe you have a different windows up oh, okay. and, and now try to advance. Oh, there we go. Okay. Thank you, John. <laughs> Thank you. Sure, sure. I haven't done remote Zooming before with shared screen. Okay, uh, this, is, this is a wonderful picture of Stu. As you can see, it was in his architectural office and he has this wonderful grin on his face and you can see what a friendly fellow he was. Stu graduated from the University of Cornell, Cornell University with a Bachelor of Architecture and his father and his brother had attended Cornell, which was a really amazing family tradition of, uh, of studying there. And then he received his MA in architecture at the University of Pennsylvania. At that time, both those universities focused on the Beaux-Arts technique of teaching architecture. So at the time that um, Stu was studying, he had been reading about modern architecture, but it wasn't part of the curriculum. The curriculum there included watercolor and painting and drawing. And uh, he did a, a variety of, of modeling and it, it was very much a hands-on kind of curriculum. But uh, after he graduated uh, from both universities, it was the depth of the depression and there wasn't much opportunity to design buildings. So as a consequence, he taught at Bard College for four years. And he, he, he told the, the Dean of the college that he, if he gave him a week's notice, he could teach anything. So he jumped in and taught art and architecture and a variety of subjects over the four years that he was there. But then in uh, 1938, he decided he wanted to go to Europe to study the built architecture by the modern masters. So he traveled to Germany and France and Holland, England and Scandinavia to look at the work of Mendelssohn, Le Corbusier, Oud and others. And, but what impressed him most were the Scandinavian architects because he really appreciated their use of natural materials. And I think that was very influential in his own development and career. In Sweden, he met Mari, his future wife, and that was it. Uh, the war had already broken out by then and they corresponded for two years while he was back in the United States and she was in Sweden but she was able to immigrate and they were married in 1940. And then after that, Stu was uh, in the Navy in Tiburon, California. And in 1946, they moved to Palm Springs to join his brother, Roger, and his father, Harry, in architectural practice, which became, we call it Williams Cubed, because it was Williams, Williams, and Williams. And they uh, had a wonderful time, the three of them, for a few years until Harry retired. Uh, like many architects, when they begin their career, they, uh, they design houses and it, it tends to launch their careers. Well, certainly designing the Sinatra house in 1947 was a great way to begin. And uh, that house, is, as many of you have probably visited, is in remarkable condition, and it is often called Twin Palms. The Idris House to the right um, is up in Little Tuscany. It's nestled into the alluvial fan there with boulders around it. And the two lower houses, Sutter and Kerner, are in Deepwell Estates. And as you can look at all four of them, and you can see how different they are. So Stu never had any kind of formula. He really worked with the clients to come up with what suited them and the program that was most appropriate for them and for the landscape and the siting of the building. In Rancho Mirage, the notable houses that Stu designed were the Kiner House, the Bly House, and the Christie House. Uh, this is a Julia Schulman photograph of the Kiner House. It was designed in 1951 for Ralph Kiner, who was a baseball player and then a, an announcer and his wife, Nancy Chafee a Kiner, a tennis player. It was one of the first to be built in the newly opened Thunderbird Country Club. You can see there's an empty lot. Can you see on the left, there's empty lot uh, next to the palm trees. 
And Stu designed a privacy wall there because he knew that there would be the development next door at the edge of the property. The south facing orientation of the house is shaded by this deep overhang as you can see. And the pool is a major feature as we'll see in several of the homes. The expanse of glass and clear story windows provided both views of the pool and garden and bring light into the living areas. Sizal carpeting, modern furniture, including an Eames chair. And it, it really indicates that the Kiners were interested in a modern aesthetic and contemporary design and a very relaxed desert lifestyle. The lower photo is from a presentation board that Stu used to illustrate current work for clients. Now this photo is of the Kiner house as it exists today. And you can see sadly that the, the glass has all been changed to French doors, the clear story window uh, glass has been changed. And so it's really quite different than the original design. The Bly house, of 1952, also at Thunderbird, had some remarkable features. This 38 foot long pool was literally in the house, separating the living and dining areas. You can see this view from the interior looking across the pool into the dining area. The uh, it looked oddly formal though, don't you think that with the wall-to-wall -wall carpeting and the tufted furniture that it really has quite a formal look to it. The clients, the Blys, were from Chicago and you can see them here rather formally dressed. He with his cigar, she with her cigarette and um, behind them, you can see that wire sculpture that was by O.E.L. Graves. His, his nickname was Bud, he was known as Bud. And he was a great friend of Stu's and collaborated with him on a number of his projects. He was also, um, Sydney, he was also the guy that designed a lot of the covers for Palm Springs Life, wasn't he? Yes, that's correct. And he also designed uh, at Coachella Valley Savings and Loan. There was a sculpture there that he designed. So there were a number of projects. But here you can see it closer up with the fish in wire. But it also acted as a barrier so people didn't fall into the pool, which was a good idea, obviously, because they had a lot of cocktail parties. <laughs> But also, sorry, photographers uh, used it a lot. You can see the two girls, the models here, one in the interior and one in the exterior, um, to indicate um, this modernist utopia of living with the swimming pool. I came across an article about this house from the Desert Sun. It was quite soon after the Blyes finished the house. And it talked about how all the golfers at Thunderbird would purposely try and hit their balls <laughs> down to the edge of the pool because they found the pool, the inside outside pool to be so intriguing. This was a very early house, wasn't it? Like 1952? It's 52, yeah, absolutely. But the other thing is they probably were looking for the models too. <laughs> um, as Stu's uh, architectural practice grew, he turned from designing residences to large civic and commercial projects, uh, buildings at College of the Desert, banks, the Palm Springs Art Museum, Crafton Hills Community College are among some of the large projects he undertook. In his late career, he designed two buildings at Eisenhower. This is the Annenberg Center for Health Science, and it was built in 1979. And the second one he did was the Hart Institute of the Desert in 1983. I will show you that in a second. This is a circular building where the entire surface is covered in octagonal ceramic tile. And it just amazes me how you could be so precise that none of the tiles had to be cut. They were fitted exactly around the perimeter. Uh, the covered walkway that faces south provides a lot of shade for uh, arriving uh, guests and patients. And inside there's a lecture hall and uh, large meeting rooms. And I know I had my COVID shot there and some of you may have had yours as well because it's a, it's, it's a very well used public space. 
This is the, the Heart Institute that was uh, commissioned by Dr. Jack Sternlieb. Who, he was the first and really an amazingly outstanding and forward thinking heart surgeon at Eisenhower. And so he commissioned Stu to design this building. Um, he, he then moved after many years of doing many heart surgeries, he moved to Florida and the Eisenhower acquired this building and now it's used for cancer care and other activities. The last house that Stu did in Rancho Mirage is the Graf Radford house. And this was built in 1986 and it accommodated the, the couple's really quite extensive art collection as well as serving as an expansive entertainment space. You can see it in a very large pool in this covered walkway. There was, I've attended events there and it's a wonderful space for entertaining. So now for the main event, here is the Keniston House. This was built in 1956 for Roderick and Anne Keniston. And the house has had a series of owners ever since with each one contributing to its stewardship. This is an exact, uh, excellent example of sensitive homeowners who appreciate architecture and what it means to occupy such a house. The entry to the house, which you see on the left, uh, provides, it's set back from the street, but it also provides privacy for the bedroom wing that is behind those, uh, those uh, translucent glass panels. However, when entering the house, you see on the right, the living space is a large spacious uh, living room that provides a really nice airy volume. Now here's a, a wonderful photo from the Desert Sun. Uh, Anne and, and Roderick, or Bill as he was called, were the original clients. Bill was one of six brothers that included James, Robert, Jack, and Douglas. In the 1950s, all the brothers owned homes in the Deepwell area of Palm Springs. And as Thunderbird Country Club opened, Jack and Robert purchased homes there, while Bill chose to, to build a house on Desert Sun Drive, which is where the Keniston house is located. And Melissa, I think you were telling me this was the original Desert Sun Ranch. Yeah, the <clears throat> Desert Sun Ranch was, um, it was owned by a guy called Phil Kirsten, and um, it was a Thompson seedless grape ranch. And when you kind of go, if you drive into the, the area where the Keniston House is, which is on public roads, you can drive all the way back, just there's one road that kind of goes all the way back. And it's like stepping back in time, you can actually see a couple of very old 30s or 40s ranch houses and they were they had grape packing warehouses there and all sorts but it's got huge overgrown palm trees and everything it's really quite um spectacular in terms of uh its authenticity and environment it just looks like it you step into the past well it's interesting because we know that deep well was a ranch at one time and then this one as well. And so there's quite a storied history in the, in the desert then of these ranches becoming developments. But in the story of the Keniston house, there have been errors attributing the house to Robert and his wife, the actress, Billy Dove. But in this photo, you can see the three brothers with their wives. In the front on the left is Billy Dove, in the middle is Anne, and on the right is Helen. And behind them are Robert, Jack, and Bill. So they were celebrating Robert's birthday. So that was the occasion. It looked like it must have been a Hawaiian party. That looks like they're all wearing lays. And uh, this, uh, on the front bench, sort of turned three quarters, are, are um, the two friends of Mari and Stu's. They were Jack and Helen Keniston. And they, they were um, very social, as all the Kenistons were. They belonged to lots of community groups and organizations. They flew planes, they owned horses, and they generally enjoyed life. So here's a photo of Anne Keniston with the two children, Mona and Roderick William. In the 1950s, the social pages of the Desert Sun, as you can see the, on the left, the full page, it talks about all the social doings of the prominent 
uh, citizens of the desert and it tracked their doings of uh, coming, going trips, uh, parties, uh, and all kinds of social occasions. And it's really a treasure trove of insights into that period of time. And I know, Melissa, you've, you've referred to that in your research, haven't you? Yes, and, and thank heaven to the Desert Sun and the fact that um, we can now access the archives because it's really such a wonderful resource. And it was, you know, really through the Desert Sun archives being put up online in the last few years that we we're actually able to identify the history of the house to some extent, because if you don't know if you don't always find out about the house being built, but you more often than not find out who the people are that moved in there or, or why they were there. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, it's a, it's a fantastic resource. And I know when I've gone to the historical society and used their resources, it's like going down a rabbit hole. You can be there for hours. The time goes by so fast. <laughs> One of the stunning features of the Keniston House is the rock wall that dips into the pool. And I should mention that unlike the Kiner and Bly houses, the Keniston was not photographed by Julia Schulman. This is really unusual because Stu had Julia shoot almost all of his projects. This is very unusual that the Keniston House was not photographed by Julius. So I'm therefore especially grateful to Jim's photos that we're using as we talk about the house. Uh, Melissa, you told me a wonderful story about contacting the adult children about living in this house and how they climbed that rock wall and jumped into the pool. But they also said that when Stu discussed the design with their parents and talked about having a pool protrude in the living room, they said, are you nuts? We have young children. So uh, the final design is still a stunning and remarkable feature of the house. It, the varied colors of the stone, uh, uh, connect the house to the natural environment. And I think this is one of the features of Stu's work is that he used a lot of warm stone and wood to uh, give a, a really uh, natural feeling to a home. In this plan, or uh, that you can see the sections, the elevations, uh, you can see how prominently the pool features so the turquoise lines there, the way it, it um, and it, the, in those days, those pools were very deep. Uh, the floor plan here, this is the original floor plan, uh, shows the master bedroom on the left and three bedrooms on the north side. So the, uh, the plan, it, it, the living and, and dining space have changed since the original plan, as you see. The, the dining is part of the living in this area, in this plan, but the family room is on the north side. The family room is now the dining room. And uh, the kitchen is now larger as it was combined with the service area. The, all the plans for this house are in the Architecture and Design Center archive at the Palm Springs Art Museum. So that's where the majority of Stu's uh, architectural drawings are held. In this uh, photo, you can see the room finish schedule. Stu was meticulous with his drawings and he was very specific about specifications. Uh, and this one shows um, the, the number of finishes that he was calling out for the interior of the house. And in the title block, you'll see that the address is shown as Desert Sun Ranch Estates. The covered patio off the living room and kitchen really affords a wonderful shaded area for outdoor dining. And because his face is west, that shaded area is particularly uh, useful, uh, especially in the, in the warm summer months. The Kennison's bought two lots. This is on the west side of the house and it has a, it's a large garden space now. This house has many chapters uh, with each owner contributing to its continuing story of stewardship. Mark Davis, who owned the house from mid 2000 for several years said that there were two or three owners before he bought the house. The aluminum siding that you see here and on the wall facing the pool had multiple coats of paint on it. And he employed three different contractors to remove the multiple layers so that they could get down to the, the natural metal. 
I, I believe though that the original color was probably a muted desert color, similar to what he used in his own house. Uh, but there are no color photographs, so we can't authenticate that. When Mark and his then wife bought it, there was wall-to-wall -wall carpeting in the living room and the hanging fireplace and planter had been removed. He eliminated the carpet and replaced the fireplace. Though the new one is not exactly like the original because the building codes had changed, which is often what happens. Um, you have to accommodate fire regulations. Okay, this is a wonderful story. When Mark Davis was furnishing the house, he was contacted by Courtney Newman of Modern Way. He's presented for you last month for Preservation Mirage. Uh, so he was contacted by Courtney that this chest was in his store. So it, amazingly enough, it had been removed from Mari and Stu's family home. This is a view of their master bedroom. And you can see the chest in the front, in the foreground. And it was actually the back of the headboard. It functioned as the chest of drawers on the bathroom side, but on the bed side, it was the headboard. And it had been removed um, and taken to Courtney's store. So uh, you can see right away that uh, it belonged in a Stuart Williams house. So Mark went right over there and picked it up. But before I move on, I want you to look in the the distance, you can see the hanging fireplace in the Williams house. And I suspect that the one in the Kennison house was very similar to that with more of a triangular form at the bottom of the, of the chimney, uh, rather than the uh, this more rectangular form that it is now. So Mark went immediately and purchased the chest and installed it here in the dining room. He also designed the cabinet on the opposite wall to mimic the cabinet Stu had designed in the master bath with louvered drawers. This is another great example of a creative and genuine homeowner. The vertical wood paneling in the master bedroom was added by Mark and it gives texture and creates wonderful light and shadow in the room. The next owners, Andrew Mandolini and Todd Goddard, are responsible re for re uh, restoring the walnut veneer cabinets that you see on the right. This is a typical feature that Stu used in many of his houses where he wanted this clean look of uh, cabinets that would be uh, uh, all in the same surface. So he used that in the Kerner house and he used it in his own house. It's in the Idris house. So this is something that um, was definitely a consistent uh, feature. During their ownership, uh, when Andrew and Todd owned the house, that's when W Magazine did that uh, very famous feature of Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie that was shot at that house. And I understand the very next day she filed for divorce. <laughs> it must have been a very stressful shoot. I'm using numerous pools in the houses that Stu designed. This prevalent Prevalence was named the Backyard Oasis by Daniel Cornell when he did his 2012 exhibition at the Palm Springs Art Museum. The pool was an essential feature of post-war leisure life. And for homeowners who came to the desert and wanted to really enjoy the warm desert climate. The Keniston pool wraps around the house and can be seen from the public areas as well as the master bedroom, now named the primary bedroom. So not only is the size of the pool changed, but the names of the room have, rooms have as well. Stu was uh, fond of adding a splash of color and the orange wall on the left uh, provides privacy for the master bedroom patio. And that's just an example of his use of color and uh, his uh, sharing of vibrancy and. Sydney, can I talk about the blade wall? Because I really yeah. love the blade wall and I think it, it's you've switched to the other photograph. Yeah. Well, no, I'll go back. There you go. Yeah, it's kind of, it's what I love about this. I mean, it's many things I love about this house, but um, one of the things I love about it is the blade wall that you have at the entry, which is actually on the next shot. Right. Um, but also that's then the house has this kind of, 
nice informality that is also has a lot of kind of poetic synchronicity and repetition that you expect from a, a really elegant architect like Stu Williams. And so to have that blade wall by the entry and then come into the desert oasis and then find the blade wall repeated at the end of the master bedroom, I think is just such a lovely design touch. Yeah, it's a good point because uh, that theme resonates then. You start seeing the way he composed it and it was it's very, of course, very deliberate. Uh, after the demolition of the Maslin House in 2002, designed by Richard Neutra, uh, preservationists really sprang into action. And Peter Maruzzi identified numerous historic properties for an intensive survey. Here's the survey primary record sheet. Uh, since then, the, the Keniston House received historic designation from the city of Rancher Mirage, which was initiated by Andrew and Todd. And in 2017, the house was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. So here's the plaque. And it really is a wonderful tribute to this house and the owners that continue to, along with the previous owners and the current owner, Lisa Brunel, they're really sensitive and appreciative of their role as stewards of important mid-century architecture. And I'm so grateful for, for people who care this much and it, it appreciate good architecture. And this is what we hope for all historic properties. And that's why we do this work, isn't it? Absolutely, it is. So <clears throat> I think one of the um, things that we, we've discovered about um, <clears throat> Stu Williams houses in Rancho Mirage is that obviously we've lost, we've already lost one, which was a Christie house that's, right. that's kind of long gone. The Bly one that has the indoor outdoor pool that you we were looking at pictures of earlier, that's still there. And if you, um, it's on um, Club View Road in Thunderbird Country Club. And if you were to go onto Google Earth, as, as one does, um, because I don't have a drone, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I take a look and I can see, okay, well, that looks, you know, more or less, it has a little kind of addition on the back. Um, <clears throat> but you can still see the indoor outdoor pool. And that house, I have to say, I feel is kind of, um, potentially under threat because it is a house that has not been looked after, but it is still there. And I'm just hoping and praying that one day somebody comes along and offers the owners, you know, the right amount of money and they manage to restore it and bring it back. Because that the Bly house, as we saw, is so well documented, both by Julia Shulman and, yeah. and the color photographs were from the uh, Robert Duano book on Palm Springs, in fact. Right. So that, you know, that was an interesting feature. And then the Kina residence, although it's still there and it's recognizable, it doesn't have quite the same artistry to it by, you know, my, my version of preservation, um, because, you know, those French doors all the way across the front, the removal of the board and back and siding and that kind of thing has really altered its look. I mean, you have the same roof shape. Um, and then the Keniston, obviously, is such an important house. So we're we're just really fortunate to to have it. And um, as you say, all the owners who've looked after it are are really the stewards. And um, would that every house uh, that has that kind of quality to it could be preserved and appreciated. So thank you for for talking to us about that, Sydney. Um, I did want. Can we just flip back to a couple of pool? Sure. For because I want to tell a couple more swimming pool stories. Um, <clears throat> I think people that know me know that I kind of like to do a bit of gossip um, with these things. So <clears throat> on Which the- one you want to go to? Oh, you know, it just, this is fine. Or maybe the one at the end, a couple at the end. Yeah. Um, the kind of residence actually, and just talk about that one for a moment. Cause um, so just flip forward a couple. There we go. Um, so <clears throat> a little bit of salacious gossip, because I know you all like enjoy that from time to time. Um, I came across a, a, 
a page in a book that Ralph Kine, I guess it was an autobiography that he wrote about building this house at Thunderbird. And um, he and his wife were very good friends with Esther Williams and her husband at the time, who was Ben Gage. So Esther Williams was well known in Hollywood for not just being an actress, but also being a swimmer. And um, apparently one night, according to Kiner in his book, Kiner and Chaffee and uh, Esther Williams and Ben Gage all went out drinking at some nightclub in Palm Springs and came back to the Kiner house and um, proceeded to carry on drinking, at which point Esther Williams decided she wanted to go for a swim. But of course, she didn't have a bathing suit with her. So she just jumped into the swimming pool completely naked. Now, apparently this was fairly common according to various myths but this is you know this isn't my story it's actually ralph kiner's and apparently he was quite sort of shocked and he tried to avert his gaze but he did say that she had the finest breaststroke uh, oh not breaststroke sorry backstroke of anyone <laughs> Um, so you can read into that what you will. And then um, similarly, because I just because the Bly House has such a fascinating pool and then at the Keniston House, one of the stories that the uh, son told me was that when he was about 11 years old, he was watching a movie on television with his parents and Anita Ekberg was in, in the movie and he kind of pointed at her and then turned to his parents and said, um, excuse me, but wasn't that woman swimming naked in our pool last week? So there's a lot of naked swimming going on in Stu's pools. And I think that's probably a, a testament to how lovely the swimming pools were. <laughs> well, and it shows you how es essential they were to their social life. Um, absolutely, yes. So, but um, so Sydney, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. I think that everyone's probably learned a lot, both about the Keniston House and about Stu's work in Rancho Mirage. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to open this up for discussion. So, if anybody wants to unmute themselves and ask Sydney a question, now's your opportunity. Anything you like. Well, you know, one thing I could add, if I may, um, when Stu talked about working on the Sinatra house, he said it was mostly Ava Gardner that he worked with rather than Frank, because Frank was so busy. And he didn't mind that a bit. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was a real charmer and he, he enjoyed is working with these fantastic people. That's great. Um, Bob, did you have a question for Sydney? Yes, I was going to ask you, Sydney. Um, you mentioned that a lot of the, uh, I don't know if the photographs, but you know, certainly the the architectural drawings are in the archives of the Architecture and Design Center downtown. Correct. And I'm, I was wondering, uh, is that something that's open to the public to go and look at these incredible uh, architectural drawings from the past. I, I'm sure that they're fragile and are not something that people want to be handling a lot. But what did they do? They wired the back. Um, I, I, I wonder if Frank Lopez is on, the, on this call today, because he could probably answer that better. He's our wonderful archivist at the Palm Springs uh -huh. Art Museum. And he, yes. are you on, Frank? Yes, I'm here. Okay, will you answer that question for me, please? Um, currently, the archives are not open to the public, but we're hoping they will be at some point. And yes, you would be able to make an appointment and look at the drawings. Thank and you. I have, I Thank you. Add, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, Sydney, go ahead, please. No, I was just going to say, um, I can say from experience working with Frank, he's the most amazing archivist and uh, he can teach you so much and find something that you think is never going to be found. <laughs> he's no. an amazing researcher. So if I, I really hope that the archive is open soon because 
that's what it's there for is it should be there as a resource for people. And that's why Stu and other architects gave their drawings there so that people can look at well, them and learn from them and, and even use them, you know, in their own like remodels or, you know, restorations. So exactly. Well, Frank, maybe I could ask you, Frank, is there any intention to digitize the collection? that it could be more easily viewable online. Yeah, the, there are some portions that of that of the archives that have been digitized. I think the uh, one of the issues with the Williams drawings, they're very fragile and uh, they're very large. So they're gonna would require special camera setups to be able to photograph all of those drawings. But that's certainly something you know, hopefully we can get a grant to do that, some kind of funding um, that would help digitize that. Great. Thank you so much, Sydney and Frank. Thanks. Right, Joe. Okay, do we have any other questions? Hi, um, this is Chris Braun. I, I really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Um, I did have one question. It is just to know how long these these homes took to build typically. Um, I know each design is different, but I'm just just curious, you know, how how difficult or how long it took for these homes to be to be built after the plans were were uh, submitted. Well, I think it certainly depended on the client and how much of a rush they were in, because the story of the Sinatra house was Stu met Frank in the in the winter of, uh, that would have been 46. And he said he wanted to be in by Christmas. So that was very quick to draw and have the plans approved and uh, building, you know, building department sign off and all that and constructed by Christmas. So it was, in those days, it was a lot faster than it is now. And there were fewer building codes than there are now too. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I have another question, Sydney, and it's for, with regards to the Sinatra house. And mm -hmm. I've heard a, uh, I heard at one point, maybe it was when I was there on a tour that originally Frank Sinatra told um, Stu that he wanted a, a nice colonial home. Yeah. Like the true. homes where he was used to, where he came from. And um, that Stuart, convinced him to go with a more modern design. Do you have any insight into how that discussion and decision came yeah. about? I think what happened was he, he just said, I don't do Georgian. And uh, he came back with some, uh, some rendering, some drawings to show what the house could look like, which would be more appropriate for the desert environment. And Frank went with that. So he, I think Stu must have turned on the charm, but I haven't got a, uh, an actual replay of the conversation. Well, thank goodness that he prevailed. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Especially in that location. And at the time it was, out, it was way out of town, you know, on the Leho Road and it was even, wasn't even paved then. So there was desert all around it. You can imagine putting a Georgian house there. <laughs> <laughs> Would have been pretty hilarious. Yeah. Well, it's a stunning house. Yeah, it is. It, but it was his first house. And I think he learned a lot as, as he uh, moved you know, through doing houses. And actually, later in his career, he said, oh, I didn't do very many houses. But then when you look at the list, there are at least 20 houses that he did. I mean, he did a lot of large uh, institutional or um, commercial projects and museum and the college and so on. So he kind of, uh, he liked the bigger jobs. He thought they were more satisfying. There was a greater challenge, I think. Uh, and they weren't as time consuming as working with clients. As we all know, people change their minds a lot. <laughs> Do you know if he had a favorite house? I think it was the Idris house. Oh yes, I would, huh. I would yeah. go. With the pool. <laughs> 
-hmm. Well, and the way it nestles into the rocks, the way the the roof line, it, it's just a, such a dramatic house and it, it's so appropriate in that site. And he, of course, um, uh, Marion's two were great friends of, of Bill and Marge Idris. They were from Seattle. He was a hotelier from Seattle and they came down to the desert and really, uh, they just became great friends. So I think that it was partly partly the design and partly the friendship that made it, him feel so warmly about the house. Mm -hmm. Makes lots of sense, it's really beautiful. But actually, um, one curious thing I wanted to mention is that two of the historic preservation commissioners for Rancho and Raja have uh, been on this call with us in Sydney. So Chris Braun, who just asked, the question about how long it would take to build the house is on the Historic Preservation Commission and Frank Lopez is also now on, on the Historic Preservation Commission and we also, Bob Berg used to be on the Historic Preservation Commission and he was just asking you questions as um, was Robert Zaffer. So I'm happy to, to know that this is the Preservation Commission is a still participation. Well I'm pleased to hear that and also um, I know Sorry. one I know one of the planning commissioners in Rancho Mirage, and she said she received a copy of your map, and she was delighted because she didn't realize there were so many important homes. That's, that's great. You know, it's, it's always good when people. That was the purpose of the map was to really point out to people. There's a lot of, and we couldn't include things that were behind. Gates or like Thunderbird Heights, we just had to refer to as a general area. But you know, there's quite a lot in Mount Jim Raj that you can drive around and look at, mm -hmm. and that's something that um, people hadn't realized. And if, um, if you're a Mount Jim Raj person, hopefully you've had the opportunity to, to go around and drive around and use that map. And if you're um, outside of Mount Jim Raj and you want, wanted to get hold of one, you can go onto our website preservationmirage.org and um, download a PDF and hopefully in due course we'll um, get the up-to-date technology and create an app or create some sort of interactive map we can use on the um, iPhones and that kind of thing but we've got to start somewhere so it's well you've done amazing work and I really applaud all of you that are working so hard on preservation and on education and this is really what it's about is when people understand the history, the legacy, and the importance, then they get passionate. <laughs> we, yes. we infect them. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a process for sure. And I think trying to get people in the city to understand what's here and, and uh, take pride of ownership if they become owners or if they are existing owners or if they're about to buy one, then that's when we, we like to try and educate them. So, yeah. Sure. Good. All right. And any other questions? Anybody got any comments or other things they want to talk about? I have a Should question. I, um, yeah, stop go. sharing my screen and then I can see you all. Um, okay. Michael, Michael Stern would like to ask a question, Sydney. Oh, Michael. Hello, Hi, Michael. <laughs> um, you mentioned the Kerner House before. Uh -huh. um, what was your relationship to the Kerner House before you knew Stu or it's anyway? Uh, well, I went there, you know this story. I, I went there. I don't think other people do. <laughs> okay, well, you're sweet, you're sweet. Um, my parents were friends with Mari and Stu and they would come to the desert from Vancouver, British Columbia, where we lived uh, for winter vacation. And we were invited, my sister and I were maybe 10 and eight. And we went to dinner, Uncle Leon, and we, played shuffleboard. The shuffleboard court is not there anymore, but the, the landscape design was by Garrett Ekbo. So it was pretty extraordinary. And I remember playing shuffleboard, not well, of course, because uh, Uncle Leon had this great technique. He could always carefully push the stone. And uh, anyway, the, it, was a, it was Easter time and the citrus was all blooming and the fragrance of the citrus and the petunias that were lining the whole length of the shuffleboard court, just, it, it's still in my memory. I mean, I think that's what, 
got me interested in Palm Springs when I was 10 years old. And here I ended up marrying the son of the architect. So it's pretty, it was almost like an arranged marriage, I have to tell you. <laughs> Um, Sydney Adele Sigelman is also on this call and she has a question. Is it true that the plans were drawn up in June and the house was completed that November? It seems a very short construction time. About Sinatra? About the Kerner. Oh, Kerner. You know, I don't know that I don't know the time frame. I think it was earlier than that because um the story that I've heard is that when Leon was here with Taya. Uh, in the winter, they stayed at the Biltmore. And while he was here in the winter, he met with Stu and outlined the program that he wanted for the house because they had no children. They had two little dogs and they had a housekeeper and you know there are certain conditions they wanted. Um, and he just deposited amount of money in a bank account and said, I want the, the house ready when I come back in November. So it was a very short period of time and apparently Stu met them at the airport and took them to the house. And uh, Leon, he was he was Czech. Um, my family's from the, uh, what was Czechoslovakia. Um, he walked around with his hands behind his back, you know, kind of looking at everything, not saying a word. And Stu was, of course, very nervous because you know he built this house. Garrett Ekpo had done the landscape. Arthur Elrod had done the interiors and by the end of it he said it's just marvelous it's just perfect so that was a great relief you know to because he hadn't seen the house under construction it was just and th in those days people didn't just you know take a phone a photograph and send it on their iPhone to the to the client so anyway it turned out very well and I'm happy that the current owners have done a fabulous job restoring the house um, it's really in meticulous condition now. Is it the way you remembered it? Uh, in some ways it is. Um, the landscape is not quite the same, but um, the, the, um, the, the wife is a landscape architect. So she has done a fantastic job with the planting. And it's a very mid-century planting. They're not trying to do sustainable. It's what the house is. It's very much in keeping with the character of the house. So, and the, the textures and the colors is very warm. The house is really very handsome. Very happy about it. Well, Adele, it's nice to see you. Now, thank you, everybody, for attending. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Sydney. Wonderful. Oh, and Linda. Hi, Linda. Um, I have a couple of, uh, just want to reiterate the housekeeping things because, um, in fact, I just got a message from someone saying, how come we haven't heard anything about our um, docent um, application? So at the beginning of this, um, for people who have signed up, I did say, and I'm just going to say it again, we um, everything got delayed this year, partly because of COVID, because the protocols were changing and we had to wait and see um, what was going to happen with Modernism Week. So if you did very kindly sign up to be docents, um, we will be sending out emails to everybody who signed up um, later this week telling you um, where to check in, what the times are, what the COVID protocols are. And um, just thank you for being patient. I'm sorry it's been delayed, but um, it's, it's just what we're dealing with at the moment. So um, for anyone who didn't um, sign up we we do actually have a full complement of docents at this point so thank you for all your interest and we really appreciate that um and actually adele added a question sydney she said why aren't there more interior photos by julius do you know on the kerner house i don't know there it's very strange isn't it there there are not that many of the interior i wonder in the archive at university of british columbia there is a Kerner archive there. There may be more photos that <clears throat> were taken by others other than Julius. That's a possibility. Okay. Any other questions? I think everyone's 
kind of starting to check out now and we've lo we've lost a few people but well, they're ready for dinner i'm sure uh, yeah or, or a cocktail or, or both or both yeah <laughs> okay well listen thank you so much uh sydney again absolutely my fantastic. pleasure really enjoyed your presentation i hope everybody else did so big big round of applause thank you, for Yay. <laughs> thank you sydney thank you thank carol you, sydney Thank you, everyone. And, um, you know, stay tuned. I've got a we've got a newsletter coming out this week. Um, we've got all sorts of news, and stay tuned to Preservation Mirage on the website. We have a new Facebook page up. Um, just keep in touch with us. We'll be in touch with you, um, and um, we'll look forward to seeing you during Modernism Week. Yes. Good luck with all your programs, Melissa. Thank you so much, Sydney, and, and I'll see you during Modernism Week for sure. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.